to the Plugged In Podcast, a new project from the Institute for Energy Research. To find out more about our work, visit our website at instituteforenergyresearch.org. Welcome to the Plugged In Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Stevens. I'm a policy analyst here at the Institute for Energy Research. Joining me today to discuss PERPA and its impact on ratepayers is Dr. David E. Dismukes. Dr. Dismukes is the Executive Director and Director of Policy Analysis at the Center for Energy Studies at Louisiana State University. He also serves as a professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences and as a director of the Coastal Marine Institute, both of which are in the College of Coast and Environment at LSU. Dr. Dismukes, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. So you recently released a new paper on PERPA and the cost implications for ratepayers. Can you start by just explaining what PERPA is, what its original goals were, and how the policy has developed over time? Yeah, uh, you know, PERPA is a very important piece of, of federal legislation, probably one of the, the signal hallmark pieces of legislation that was passed in the 1970s that started to transform the power industry. And I would argue probably the first big piece of, of legislation that helped facilitate competition in the industry. Um, part of the goals for PERPA back in that time period, this was in the late 1970s, 1978, um, in the aftermath of the first big energy crisis that we had in the early 1970s. And part of the goal of PERPA was to address potential perceived shortcomings in the power side of, of the energy business overall. And the goal was primarily to facilitate uh, the efficient use of electricity, the efficient generation of electricity in, in the power sector, and also to, to try to uh, maximize the capacity opportunities for development that were um, ongoing or had the potentials for being developed during that time period. Uh, when Purple was first passed, uh, it started. It, it opened up and removed a number of market barriers for what we refer to today and then as non-utility generators. Back prior to 1978, the industry was almost exclusively dominated by vertically integrated utilities. They own the generation, the transmission, and distribution components of, of providing service. Um, so it's very hard if you weren't a utility to go in and provide, let's say, bulk power or wholesale-oriented power just to put the power to the grid uh, if you weren't a vertically integrated utility. What PERPA did was started to kind of chip away at those barriers that utilities dominated by their vertical integration and allowed uh, these non-utility generators to essentially sell electricity uh, to utilities and the terms and conditions were outlined in, in that legislation. And as a consequence of that, we saw a, a very big explosion of, of non-utility generation. Ultimately, as we moved through the 80s and into the 90s, that was the, the primary basis for the non-utility sector or the independent power sector that we think of today. But when you think about those time periods, it, the, the generation that was being stimulated uh, was both uh, thermal, uh, traditional fossil fueled industrial generation, for lack of better words, and renewables. And if you think about the low hanging fruit or what was considered the lower hanging, more efficient opportunities during that time period, it was mostly with what we call the combined heat and power or the co generation opportunities at industrial facilities and less so on the renewables. Primarily because if you think about 1978 and the technologies for renewables at that time period, they were very, very expensive. So most of the quote-unquote qualifying facilities that were developed as a consequence of PERPA uh, were essentially power plants at industrial facilities. It wasn't until we moved into the 1990s and the current time period that we've seen uh, the, the renewable side of this industry started to grow under these uh, PERPA provisions. Sure, and as you alluded to, in order to open up these markets, what PERPA did was establish these new generating facilities that would essentially receive a special rate and regulatory treatment. Right, and, and so some of the, 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 the hallmark components of that legislation were, first is it required utilities to interconnect with these non-utility generating resources. That is, it couldn't just say no to these generators. They, it had to, had to actually provide the interconnection opportunities for those non-utility generators to put their power to the grid. Uh, the second thing is it had to provide standby and emergency power and other types of backup power for these facilities. So it couldn't hold these facilities hostage, so to speak, in terms of its emergency requirements or other requirements. And the third provision, which is the most important one, which has become the more controversial one um, 
for cogeneration facilities back in the 70s and the 80s and part of the 90s. And today, which is a discussion point of my paper in the research I've done in, in, the, in the last two decades on renewable energy, has been this idea of avoided cost. So when a non under PURPA, when a non-utility generator provides electricity to the to the utility or to the grid, the utility is required to pay back that generator, not at the generator's cost, but at the utility's cost, what we refer to as the avoided cost. And you know, back in those days, we didn't have markets, we didn't have pricing indices like we have today. Those costs had to be estimated. And uh, those avoided costs were the payments that actually went to the non-utility generator. So if you were a non-utility generator and you could essentially generate electricity, develop and generate electricity, and put it to the grid at a, at a rate that was lower than what this avoided cost was, then you could make a profit uh, and a return on your investment during that time period. As you can imagine, since we didn't have markets during that time period, it became incumbent upon regulators to figure out what those avoided costs would be and how they would be set. And as you can imagine, with 50 different states out there, there were a number of different policies and processes by which those avoided costs were set and determined. Yeah, the main focus of your paper is explaining how the calculation of these avoided costs, along with several other factors, the way that these are being implement, implemented are, is passing uh, on costs to the actual ratepayers. Uh, do you mind just outlining what all those costs are and where they're coming from? Well, I think one thing before getting in that's important to keep in mind that one of the reasons why one of the reasons why states actually set these uh, avoided cost rates as opposed to, say, the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or the federal government, is to maintain this kind of um, jurisdictional and federalist split between states, which are primarily responsible for retail rate making matters, and the federal government, which is primarily uh, relegated to um, keeping control over markets that are engaged in interstate commerce. And so it has been – while while PURPA defines an avoided cost payment and it defines the process by which these generators will be paid back, the actual rate determination is set by many of these states. And so every state has kind of a different set of pil uh, policy priorities. And over time, particularly with regards to these renewable energy initiatives, you've seen different priorities for many states. And they've been, in, in some of these states, have actually tried to at least historically create beneficial environments uh, to, to encourage renewable generation um, within the context of these avoided cost rates. So some of the, th the ways that they do that, and some of the ways that it, that have, I would argue, have been taken advantage of through the through the, the current. Through the current process, it's been through what we call adders or uh, beneficial uh, margins or premiums that have been applied by some states to either include the the environmental attributes of a renewable generator or to help facilitate uh, a premium so that they can get financing. Um, there are other provisions in there in terms of it's an open-ended uh, put for many of these uh, developers. It's not fixed, so you don't have a fixed time frame, so it's a kind of call option that you can always go in and put that power to the grid at that price whenever you want to. So that creates a benefit that uh, results in a potential cost to utilities and ultimately to ratepayers. Um, the contract terms under which many of these uh, renewable energy contracts can be a form of, of subsidy too, um, because they will be for durations that may often be longer than what the prevailing contract terms are in a market today. Most of your contract terms can be very, very short run, short run in nature, particularly over the last two decades. Increasingly, we're seeing some of those terms get longer. But if you look over the last five to ten years, contracts of three to five years were really long contracts. Back in the 70s, contracts of 15, 20, 25 years were more common. For many of these renewable resources, they're signing more of the latter, more of those longer-term contracts as opposed to those shorter-term contracts that we see in today's market. So that affords them a very big opportunity um, uh, relative to to um, uh, other forms of generation. The other thing that's, that is unique that gets hidden in all of this is the fact that when utilities have to sign these longer-term deals with renewable generators, and it's an open-ended obligation to them, it's a, what we call a standard offer, that kind of a take-it-or-leave-it offer, as utilities accrue more and more of these liabilities, those actually have balance sheet implications. And one of the somewhat hidden costs that you don't see in all of this is the fact that as a utility incurs more of those liabilities, it can have a financial implication because it represents essentially a future payment that it has to make, like debt or anything else, 
and that can impact its credit ratings, and that in turn can have a cost implication that quite often doesn't get seen, I think, in the, in the rate-making process or directly highlighted in, in this process associated with avoided costs. And then lastly, since most of these costs get uh, – plowed back through into rates through what we call a fuel adjustment clause or some other what we call energy-based rate, which is essentially a volumetric-based rate, a per kWh type-based rate. Because it goes through that way, um, it has a way of being somewhat regressive. Uh, you can think of it like a sales tax. And for every unit of electricity you're buying, somewhere embedded in that is going to be a payment that goes back associated with these longer-term contracts on these, uh, these PERPA, um, essentially, provisions and those create ratepayer costs as well. Sure, with the long-term contracts too, in the paper you provide an interesting example in Colorado where it seems like even for people who are very favorable to, towards uh, renewable development that people are en- end up paying more for wind and solar than they otherwise would in a competitive market. That's right, that's right. There are provisions within here for these PERPA contracts, for instance, that are less than 20 megawatts, but you can think of the benefits with big, large capital investments in the renewable energy space where larger may drive down some of your average cost if you are opening that up to a competitive bid for larger type projects, you might get a different market outcome. And that's, that's part of the process, too, is you're taking essentially an old 1978 car and you're trying to fit it on the highway of today, and it doesn't really fit. It, it's, just, it's, it's inefficient. Uh, it's not state-of-the-art. It doesn't reflect current you know, operating guidelines and operating practices in the power business. And that's one of, I think, the biggest problem in all of this is you know, we have all these robust markets that are out there right now. We have, the abil- we, have th- we have the ability to do things today in 2019 that we didn't in 1978 or 1982 or 1987 or whenever the date is. Go and pick that you know, prior to opening up these markets in the mid-1990s. And, but we, we really haven't – these provisions within PURPA really haven't evolved to reflect that. Yeah, and you talk about some of the reasons why the buyback provisions aren't necessary, and you alluded to it there, the Energy Policy Act in 1992, the existence of the OATTs. Um, Do you want to just talk a little bit about how some of these other factors that basically are um, make the PURPA buyback uh, provisions unnecessary? Right, right. So going back to to our discussion we had earlier, you know, PURPA was needed during the time period that it was passed to help eliminate market barriers for these non-utility generators because we had those vertically integrated utilities. Today, that's just not the case anymore. There's so many other provisions out there and rules and regulations associated in legislation that associated with electric power markets that make many of those provisions moot. So, you know, you talk about the Energy Policy Act of 1992 that started really taking that those PURPA provisions and expanding them one step further by opening up all the power transmission systems on an open and non-discriminatory basis to anybody who wants to move power uh, from, let's say, Maine to Florida, from Louisiana all the way up to Michigan. Those are those provisions are, exist today, and they did not exist in the 1970s and the 1980s when PURPA was in kind of full bloom. Um, you talked about the, the open access tar- transmission tariffs, which are a byproduct, again, of the Energy Policy Act of 1992 and several other FERC orders that came after that. Uh, those open access uh, transmission tariffs are OATS. Those uh, define the rules and conditions by which generators of any type, whether they're utility-owned or non-utility-owned, interconnect into the grid and the rights and the terms and conditions that they have to pay and what they'll have to do in order to connect their resources. And again, that provides a non-discriminatory basis for interconnection that in 1978 and 1980s you didn't have, right, and PURPA needed and tried to address. So we don't need those today. Um, We trade electricity as a commodity on markets all over the United States today. Uh, That was something that we didn't do back in the 70s and the 80s and even into the 1990s. So trying to come up and and, and figure out a quote-unquote administratively avoided cost, what is that cost at the margin, you don't really need today because you've got market signals out there, much like you do at the Henry Hub for natural gas or the WTI index for crude oil. We have comparable indices out there for power that many utilities see and monitor on an hour-by-hour basis. And so using that price to reflect market opportunities is much more efficient than going back to this old school kind of 1980s way of doing things that is having regulators sit around and scratch this out on a piece of paper and figuring it out. And then with that that calculation, overlaying and layering on a bunch of bennies uh, to that as well.
So you also include an empirical discussion about the expansion of renewable uh, and qualified facility capacity um, in recent years. Can you give our listeners an idea of the scope of this expansion and um, how much has it grown lately? Well, it's grown considerably. As I mentioned before, if you look at, say, prior to the early 2000s, most of the renewable energy generation that was developed under PURPA uh, from a renewable side was mostly associated with things like um, hydro facilities, small-scale hydro, and a lot of wood and waste wood byproducts and other types of renewable waste uh, from ag waste that were burned uh, in a co-firing application. Um, As essentially policy and economics have changed in renewables, you've seen uh, a large amount, an expansive amount of growth start from uh, to the early 2000s to today. And we kind of tabulated up those numbers. These are all the applications that are made to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And you can, you can kind of see that explosion of growth um, almost as much as a six-fold growth by the time we start in, say, 2002, 2003, where we have you know, less than a gigawatt of capacity to by 2012 and even to 2016 we have anywhere from six to, to, to seven gigawatts of capacity. So, you know, six, seven-fold increase in the amount of generation that's provided from renewable resources just during this time period. Starting off early, as you can imagine, with wind. Uh, wind was a big beneficiary of this, particularly in the aftermath of 2005 and 2006 when we had that big rush and increase of natural gas prices after Hurricane Katrina and the big challenges we had up into the recession. And then more recently, I'd say over the last four years, that, that, that share, while it's still large and significant in total amount, the share of that renewable generation is starting to shift more and more into solar and away from wind. So in the last three, four years, uh, particularly in 2016, you saw a huge amount of growth associated with, with solar resources trying to take advantage of these provisions. And with wind, especially, you see an additional loophole with the one-mile disaggregation rule. Yeah, the, the one-mile disaggregation uh, loophole is, is just a, one of another, I think, factors that just kind of underscores why PURPA has probably seen its better days and it's time to reform this and move on. This is clearly attempts of kind of breaking up projects and disaggregating them into small piece parts for the sole intent and purpose of getting around rules and regulations to essentially qualify for the special pricing provisions that are included in this legislation. It is nothing but an attempt to essentially work around um, the existing regulation to take advantage of what is more favorable than what is in the market. Because if the market and these kind of administratively determined avoided costs were in sync with one another, you wouldn't have a big incentive to want to take advantage of these provisions. And because there is a difference and there is a subset of generators out there that can arbitrage that difference, they're essentially taking advantage of that, and you're seeing that in the numbers, you know, those growth numbers that we talked about before in terms of the resource additions. Again, I think that in large part has to do with some of those, those uh, blue poles. From the perspective of rate payers, what's the is there a figure that you can provide that sort of gives us an idea of what this has cost uh, rate payers over time? Yeah, I mean, we we did some rough numbers. This is really hard to know because you you would have to get into all the the sub details associated with how each and every state actually sets their avoided costs and pays back these contracts. But we did some kind of back of the envelope, kind of rough general estimates that I think are relatively conservative at somewhere around forty eight dollars um, a megawatt hour. And we're a little bit under a half billion dollars a year over the last five years in terms of total payments that have been made on these resources. You sum that up, that's about two point three billion dollars. You know, that's I would argue that's a conservative number because if you look at uh, say a higher amount like sixty six dollars per megawatt hour, which we know for a fact, for instance, in Montana at one time, they were paying their QFs as that much, if not more, in other places of the state. If you were to use that number, which is about thirty seven percent higher, that 500, a little under 500 million a year would be something more like 640 million a year, and that 2.3 billion would be somewhere around 3.1 or over 3 billion dollars. The point being in all of this is whether it's you know 3 3 billion or 2.8 billion, whatever that number is, is who's paying for this cost, and that's ratepayers. And why are they paying for this cost? Because it's really not necessary to help facilitate renewable energy development out there. There are tons of provisions in the tax code right now that we have that allow for both at the state and the federal level that continue to provide favorable treatment for renewable energy generation. Um, As you know, there are tons of states out there, 30-some-odd states, I think over 70% of the 
retail sales in the United States are in states that have renewable portfolio standards or RPSs that provide guaranteed markets. And this is a state policy, not a federal policy, and is a state guaranteed market for these resources. Um, these are all – you have essentially trading platforms and in the PJM and other places and SPP and in MISO that help facilitate the economic transfer of renewable energy across their entire footprint, not just within states. So you've got a lot of market and institutional mechanisms and policy mechanisms that support renewable energy. This is just an unneeded subsidy that people have to pay for that needs to kind of be closed out. You know, I certainly wouldn't argue to go back and, and, and renegotiate contracts or avoid the contracts that have been cut to date. I think we should observe the sanctity of the contracts we've cut under these provisions to date. But on a foregoing basis, it's, kind of, it's time to essentially pull the training wheels off of this and start letting these resources and these developers rely on the same kind of market institutions that other big renewable energy projects do that don't fit under this 20, uh, 20 megawatt um, threshold for, for these uh, particular transactions. And there's sort of an interesting tension that's involved with this and that it seems pretty clear that PERPA originally was probably a necessary step in order to liberalize our electricity markets. Um, But as we've sort of laid out here over time, those reforms have sort of stagnated and maybe for public choice reasons, given the concentrated benefits and diffused costs, um, people have been able to gain the system and it's been difficult to see Um, real reform. Uh, In the paper, you outlined some state-level initiatives. Can you briefly explain how that process has played out in a couple states and then um, just how renewable energy developers are responding to these reform initiatives? Yeah, so there there are a number of big state battles that have, have, have occurred over the last several years and continue to go on and on over these, as you can imagine, they're very generous provisions, and so you have a lot of stakeholders and vested interests that are involved, and they certainly don't want to see these go away. So if you think about states like Idaho or Montana or North Carolina that have tried to reform these um, processes, they've been very, very hard fought. For instance, in Idaho, several years ago, many of the utilities were looking at thousands of megawatts of new uh, capacity obligations that they were going to have to sign from these new renewable energy developers. The problem for many of these utilities is the fact that they didn't need the capacity. And that's the other problem in all of this is it is a mandatory purchase requirement for utilities. Whether you need the capacity or not, you have to buy that. And that's a very big problem in today's environment since we've invested so much, again, in public policy on energy efficiency, in terms of standards for appliances and electricity use, the investments we're making in smart metering and other types of changes that are making households more efficient in how they use electricity. Electricity, The load growth and our requirements for capacity are, are pretty much flat, to, in some instances, declining. We just don't need any more generation. It doesn't matter if it's coal-fired, nuclear-fired, or renewable-fired. It's really is an issue of taking advantage and making the system that we have now more and more efficient, which is what you see doing. But for many of these places, for many states that have been trying to reform this, one of the things that they look at is you know, whether or not the utility needs more of this capacity. For many of these utilities, they don't need it. So they would like to you know, trim down on the amounts that they have to purchase or trim down on those contract durations. Rather than taking a fixed contract at a 15- or 20-year period, You know, how about one that changes every three years and is updated for market conditions? Uh, and is renewable over their three- to five-year period that's more reflective of what you'd see in the market. And again, Idaho was an example of that, uh, where they tried to change those rules and fix them such that they were more in line with the market. Montana was another one that, again, tried to cut these contract terms down from a, somewhere around 15 to 20 years down to three and to reduce those over those, those avoided cost payments from a number that was somewhere north of $60 a megawatt hour, I believe somewhere around $66 a megawatt hour, down to about 33 or half of that. Uh, keep in mind that that $66 megawatt hour number that they had was set back in 2011, 12, 13 time period when natural gas prices were real, real high and, and, and the, the cost of all this unconventional development that we have today hadn't been factored in, in the market. You probably had natural gas prices that are around $8, 9 $10 per MMBTU, upon which that $66 is set, as opposed to today where the market's you know barely breaking in, in peak summertime at $2 in MCF. So all those are things that need to be updated and changed, and you've seen states try to do that. And, it's, and there's been a lot of fights associated with that. Some have won. Some have not. Some have had to make some pretty big compromises that continue to perpetuate some of these um, very generous offerings, but probably not as bad as they've been in the past, if that makes sense. 
Sure, yeah. And it's, it seems like the um, ideally the policy discussion would be focused on just trying to repeal this completely. But politically, if complete repeal isn't possible, could you outline a few possible reforms that could improve the situation? Yeah, there's there's a couple, I think, of real easy ones that regional people ought to be able to agree on. One is that if you have a utility that doesn't have a capacity need, they have reserve margins that are, let's say, far in excess of what they need for reliability purposes, for their planning purposes, which usually is in the 13 to 15 percent range, those utilities shouldn't be required to have to buy any new capacity, renewable or anything else for that matter. And so that ought to be at least one screening tool and one screening process that we inject into this. Uh, even if we're not going to get rid of the process, and that is, if if you're a utility and you don't need the resource, it shouldn't be essentially you shouldn't be required to purchase that. The other thing is is on the contract terms is nobody should be also forced into a long term contract if it doesn't need the capacity or doesn't or the market outlook is uncertain on a foregoing basis for that contracted energy. And I think one of the best ways of fixing that is either through you know an administrative determination of whether or not. The, the, the contract terms are too long or too generous or just opening it up for a competitive bid. And there are lots of markets out there today that use competitive bidding both in renewable energy as well as in conventional energy, and, and that is something that ought to be considered and injected into this process. And again, the, the one-mile um, disaggregation loophole that we talked about before, that would be an easy fix that I think uh, should be injected if we're not talking about full appeal of the overall provisions in PURPA. Is there anything that we haven't discussed here today that uh, you think our listeners should know about FERPA? I don't think so. I think the the big thing to take away in all this, though, is it is a rate making issue, and it, I mean a rate payer issue. Um, the people that ultimately pay for this are the rate payers. Uh, I think the renewable energy lobby has been very successful in terms of trying to couch this as a, a big uh, power play, no pun intended, between themselves and the electric utility industry. When, in fact, I think the utility industry, while they have been somewhat responsible in terms of addressing these issues, from a financial perspective, can be somewhat indifferent about it. Because, look, they're always going to wind up they, – they get – their, their retail services are priced on a cost of service regulatory basis. And if their costs go up, well, it's ratepayers that pay for that. It's not coming from their shareholders, uh, at least not over any longer extended period of time. And if it were starting to cost their shareholders money, all they would need to do is go to their regulators – and show how it was deteriorating on their on their achieved rates of return in order to change their rates to get back to their allowed rates of return to offset the costs associated with these provisions. So ultimately, this is a rate payer provision. These are costs that you and I and every household, every business, every industry has to pay for, and it's just not needed. I mean, it would be one thing when we were back in 1978, 1980 again, and you had these very strong market barriers that were out there, and you had these – you know, lack of policy tools in order to promote renewable energy. That's just not the case anymore. And so it's just that this is just something that has may have been great at its time back in the 70s, just something that's just not needed today. And it's, and it's you know, creating loopholes and other opportunities for gamemanship that just need to go away. Where can people go to read your paper? And are there any other projects that you or your team at the uh, Center for Energy Studies down at LSU that are working on that you think our listeners might be interested in? So uh, yeah, we we can, can uh, you can download the the report on uh, our homepage. It's uh, www.enrg.lsu.edu. That's energyenrg.lsu.edu, and it should there should be a link on that main page. If it's not there, you can go to the publications page. You can see not only this work that we've done, but a whole host of other things that we're doing. Uh, we work across the entire. Um, set of energy sectors from upstream oil and gas all the way down to renewables. We've increasingly been doing more and more on renewable integration work and the costs and challenges associated with integrating renewables. Uh, We've been looking at a lot of issues associated with net metering, uh, and we've got publications on uh, on our page with regards to renewable energy that uh, your listeners may may be interested in in downloading um, on our page as well. Great. My guest today has been David E. Dismukes of the Center for Energy Studies at Louisiana State University. Dr. Dismukes, thank you for taking the time to speak today. Thank you for having me. 